Uh, hi, so my name is Gregor Levan. I come from Josef Stefan Institute I'm, and I'm basically a researcher in machine learning, information extraction. And one of the projects that we recently finished was also uh, related to uh, collecting news and extracting information from news. So this is one of the, basically the products that we developed as a result of the project and I'll be talking about it. So it's called Event Registry. Um, so this is publicly available, I'll also be demoing it, but as an introduction I'll just show a few slides. So Event Registry is basically a system that first of all collects news in different languages throughout the world. Um, and then from this news we extract and identify events which are mentioned in the news. So we find groups of articles that talk about the same event. And then we call this an event and then extract information about this particular event. And on top of this data that we then extract and collect, we provide uh, extensive search options and rich visualizations. Uh, so first we need to define what an event is. So for us an event is simply something that's significantly happening in the world. So the assumption is if that, if that something is significant, then it's going to be reported by several news publishers. So if, let's say, a plane crashes, then it's for sure going to be reported by several publishers. Now, if somebody in New York has an opinion about something and he writes a news article about this, that's probably not an event because that's his opinion. He's only the, the only one reporting about this and so on. So that we don't detect as an event. Uh, so for us, an event then is identified by finding a group or a collection of news articles that all talk about the same thing. So here is an example of an event that we, we can uh, identify. So here we see that we have found an event that has uh, 800 articles. Some of these articles are in some in German, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and so on. And from all these articles, we are then able to extract main event information. So we are able to extract the title of the event, or when the event happened, where it happened. We can assign categories. We can also extract main entities and top keywords. And that's basically an event in a structured form that can be shown to the user. And this is basically the output that we would like to get as a result of the text processing in the system. Now, as you can assume, this probably involves a lot of work, a lot of steps. I don't have time to go through basically most of these steps. I'll be just mentioning a few of the points. First of all, of course, we need, the collect, we need to collect the data. So for this, we have our own service, which is called Newsfeed, which collects about 300,000 news articles per day. From online news publishers, uh, we collect uh, the news from the RSS feeds. And the data that we currently import is in 15 languages. So basically, it's mostly uh, European languages plus Chinese. Uh, we have news in Arabic, Turkish, and so on. Uh, so once we collect the data, we do some text processing on, on it. So one of the things that was also mentioned yesterday was, for example, that words are often not enough. So you want to go beyond words. You want to know the meaning of the words. So that's where semantic annotation comes in. And for example, here is a simple example where we, have, where we have mentions of the word Chicago, which means different things. So in the first two cases, it means simply the, it means the, the typeface of the font which is used in Mac, whereas in the other three cases it means one is the, the band and the other two are the Chicago uh, albums produced by that band. So what's important then is to know the meaning of these words. And that's one of the problems of the language. So the ambiguity is one of the problems. And the second, of course, is this variability. Because let's say you have the word Mac and Macintosh, which mean the same thing, but it's expressed differently. So if you do the keyword search, you will be basically missing a lot of information. Um, and that's why this entity linking, which was also mentioned previously, is very important. So entity linking is basically finding the meaning of the words and then linking those words to the knowledge base. So you can use different knowledge bases. In our case, we use, for example, Wikipedia as the knowledge base. So we are able to link individual words to concepts in the knowledge base. And we have a system. Um, I, will, I, I could show a demo of this system, but I think I'll uh, spend too much time showing it. Basically, it's a system you can paste in a document, and it can annotate with the concepts that are mentioned in the document. And this works for 100 languages. 
Another important task is also comparing documents. So um, whenever you do a Google search, let's say you basically, in essence, you're doing some kind of uh, comparing of your query with the documents that, that exist online. Now, if you have documents in different languages, how do you compare them? That's also one of the issues. And uh, there are at least two ways. So one way is that you basically do a document a translation that's very costly, that's slow. And another way, for example, that we use is canonical correlation analysis. This is highly mathematical uh, procedure. Uh, so you can, that's also why it's grayed out. But in essence, what it does is basically you can give it two documents in different languages and it will produce you a score between zero and one, depending on how similar the, the two documents are. So this doesn't involve translation, but it still works uh, pretty well. Um, so now we come to the phase of event construction. So here, what we want to do, in order to find events, basically we need to group articles that are similar enough, that all talk about the same event. So for that part, we use uh, a clustering. So here again, it's not the target group where I would be talking about clustering. So I'll be just saying that we use some information from the articles all the information which is relevant, so basically title, content, and the named entities to group the documents that belong to the same event. And another very important part is also, okay, once you have a cluster, let's say you have a cluster of English articles, and then you have a cluster in Spanish. So how do you know if those two clusters are talking about the same event or not? So here, for example, we have a SpaceX launch which is described by a set of English articles, and then we have a set of uh, Spanish articles. And here again, we need to decide if those two clusters belong or actually describe the same event or not. And we do this again using machine learning. So we extract a number of features and then decide based on this with highly accurate model if two clusters are about the same event or not. So once we've done all that, now we have one or more clusters. In this case, we have several clusters in different languages. And now we say, okay, here is an event. We create a unique ID for that event, and then also extract main information such as location, event date, entities, keywords, categories, and so on. So now I'll switch to the demo. So you can actually see what you can do with the system. So as I said, the demo is available on this uh, address. So it's eventregistry.org. Uh, so what you can see now is basically the live feed of events as they are updated with the new articles that are, uh, that are coming into the system. Each of these circles in the, on the map is one event which is currently being updated with new information. So here, we, for example, we have an event where the man, shot, uh, the man was shot after killing eight people in Minnesota. Um, so below here we have some statistics. So currently in the system we have 140 million news articles. And from these 140 million articles we have identified 5 million events. Here below you can see what's currently popular in the news from the perspective of people, organizations, countries, and so on. And here we have some top events. So if we want to do some search on this database of uh, events, let's start with uh, Ebola. So Ebola was a big topic, let's say, a year or two years ago. So now we said that we want to find all events related to Ebola uh, throughout the, the, the database that we have. Currently, we have uh, the data for the last three years. I think currently somebody else is also doing the search. So <laughs> let me switch to another website with the same data. So uh, this is basically now uh, a list of events that all match uh, the Ebola. So we see that we have 20,000 events related to Ebola. So what I've done here again, I remind, so this is not a keyword search, so this is the concept search. So this is the using the annotations that we get by, uh, by semantically annotating the content. So now each of these is one event, we can open any of these events, and I'll show later on what, uh, what we can see for each event. Uh, but additionally, you can also visualize and aggregate results in different ways. So one, you can say, okay, show me what are the top entities related to this. So let me zoom in a little bit. So these are the, let's say, the top entities and top keywords related to event that are mentioned in the events about Ebola. So you can see here we have locations, West Africa, Liberia, Guinea, and so on. And here we have top keywords. So we have Ebola virus, so here is a mistake. 
we have disease health and so on. Um, you can also say, okay, show me where did these events happen. So now, since we are basically able to extract the actual locations where the event happened, we can show these locations of the events on the map. So we can see for all the events that we have, we have the majority of them are in Africa, of course, but we have also a lot of them in Europe and a lot of them in, in US. Um, additionally, what you can do is you can also select a subset of data on the timeline below. And then you can see, okay, at the beginning we have all the events are actually happening in, in Africa. But then as we move on, we'll start seeing that, you know, the, the events and the because of the patients, which actually started appearing in other parts of the world, we also see events actually popping up in different areas. So at some point you'll also see that it basically switches. So it's starting dominating the, the other part of the, the world. So in this way, you can see how basically the, uh, a particular topic in this case evolves over time geographically in this case. Um, you can also say, okay, so who are the top news publishers who are reporting about Ebola? So here we have a list. So we have All Africa, Mail Online, Reuters, El Economista, and so on. So this is in the decreasing order. And you can also see geographically where these publishers are located. Uh, so you can also see, let's say, let me switch to this one here. So here, this is something that takes a few seconds, uh, but it actually computes how individual concepts, uh, these semantic annotations, are trending over time in the events about Ebola. So let me zoom out. So the system automatically finds what are the top concepts about Ebola, right? Uh, and then it shows you uh, how many articles per day were published in the events about Ebola that mentioned this particular concept. So for, for example, on this particular date, on 8th of August, we have 62 articles that are mentioning Ebola. Whereas maybe for some other concepts, it's a different number. So this is especially relevant if you know what you are searching for. For example, let me just remove a few of those. Uh, so if you remember, there was at, at one point there was uh, the first patient, let's say, in Texas. So you can say, okay, show me uh, the Texas. And now it, you can see that at this point, for example, was it seems that they found the first patient who appeared in Texas. And from then on, Texas is somehow trending also in these events. And similarly, there was a patient in Madrid. And when you, when, when you add it, basically it's added to the graph. So you can see from this point on, Madrid then is also being mentioned a lot in the events about Ebola. Maybe the last visualization that I would show is these categories. So this is then the, um, so we are automatically categorizing the news. And uh, as you know, in the news you have categories like arts, business, sports, and so on. So this is our top uh, level taxonomy, which is, also then in different levels. So on top level, you can see that 42% of events about Ebola are related to health issues. Then a subset of that is specifically to the conditions and diseases, and even a smaller subset is these infectious diseases. So we have these three levels of taxonomy. But you can also see that, for example, a subset of events are about society and society issues. And then even a subset is, is business-related events about Ebola. So for example, here we have a segment of events which are related to stocks and bonds. And if I click this segment, for example, now you can see the list of events about Ebola on how Ebola basically influences the stock prices. So here, for example, if I search Ebola, so you can see that, for example, here it mentions that uh, Ebola influences somehow these Procter & Gamble stock prices. So you can see different influences of one particular uh, thing that you're searching for. Um, just as an alternative, so now we have only been doing searches by this uh, concept. You can also search by normal keywords. You can say that you want to find, let's say, only events that happen in, let's say, London. And now you would just get the list of events from London. 
Uh, similarly, you can say, okay, just show me events reported by a particular news publisher. Uh, you can limit, of course, by date and time. And you can also uh, limit by category. So, for example, this category is interesting if you want to, if you're interested in these disasters. So, for example, you can very easily uh, make a search that will produce um, a list of events that are related to natural disasters. So I think this is still the previous search. Uh, so yeah, that's so now you have basically all the disasters that happened. So we have 6,000 disasters that we detected. So we have the Italian earthquake, Ecuador earthquake, and so on. Um, so that's about, let's say, the search options. Um, maybe if we check if the, the original page works. Maybe just as an example of what you can get if you basically open one particular event. So let's say here this man uh, who shot the, the, who stabbed eight people in Minnesota Mall. So if you open one particular event, the one thing that you can get is basically simply the list of all articles uh, that describe this event. And you have this separated by language. So here is the coverage in English language. You can switch to German, and then you'll get the list of German articles that talk about the same event. Um, and similarly for other languages. Uh, you can also get the top concepts, so what, what this event is about. So these are again the entities and keywords. Uh, you can see how the publishing about this event progressed. So now we basically will show you know, when the event happened and then how media picked up. And then each of these bubbles is one article. And you can see that, for example, first the English media picked up a lot and then it was followed by French media, Italian, and Spanish, and other languages. Um, OK, I think it's enough about the demo. I would just maybe mention that um, this data is all available through the API. So if you have at least some Python skills, uh, you can easily use the Python library that's provided. And you can simply, so for example, this line of code, these lines of code would get you all the events about Barack Obama that are related to society issues that have been cover, covered at least by BBC uh, as the news publisher. And then you'll get the list of results by calling this execute query. And the results are provided in JSON. So it's the easiest way possible to parse. Uh, here are some other examples. Maybe just to mention the ongoing work. So. Um, one of the things that you can do with this data is you can easily detect, for example, a news bias. So news bias can be present in different ways. So one of the ways, for example, that you can uh, check is uh, how different news sources are cited in the media. You can detect how uh, male or female are being mentioned in the news articles or events. Uh, you can detect topic bias, geographical bias, uh, bias in the use of vocabulary. Um, we also uh, compute how information propagates. So since, you, uh, since we have an event and we have all the articles that talk about this event, we can easily see how information about this event was propagated between publishers. And in this way, you can build a graph where you can see you know, who, who is typically the source and who is the, basically the sink of the information. Um, another thing that you can do is you can also try to uh, do slot filling or this info box extraction where we try to find uh, more structured information about the events that we detect. For example, for earthquakes, we'd like to see, you know, what's the magnitude of the earthquake, uh, the people who were involved, and so on. And the last thing is this causality. So one of the things that we can also do is we can find related events. And if we know how to find related events, then we can also find common patterns. So you can find, for example, that after a flood in a particular area, there is often an outbreak of a disease. And if you can do this generally, then you can say, OK, this is a general pattern. And then you can uh, maybe provide some good uh, feedback. So I think I, I would end here. So if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you um, for this.
this impressive pre presentation. I would like to ask uh, what is the purpose of this event registry, first of all, and second, um, how do you assign uh, an article to your taxonomy? Because an article may be assigned in two categories or more. What do you mean by category to, to two events? Yes. Uh -huh. So who is the user of this? So, um, so today we have plenty of registers, right? So we have, you could say Wikipedia is a kind of a register because you have all the entities mentioned on Wikipedia. Uh, you can have a registry of companies, you can have a registry of various things, but we don't have any kind of registry of things that are happening in the world. So that's basically a kind of a, the goal of the event registry is somehow to, to provide a structured view on the things that are happening. So the user can be anybody in the, let's say, social sciences who wants to, I don't know, explore what are the natural disasters. Where did they happen? So using this query that I did before with the natural disasters, if you visualize the locations, you can easily see what are the locations where the natural disasters happen, right? So there is no other way how you can do this automatically, currently. At least I don't know of any. So you can have a custom databases so maybe you ha you can have a publisher who's only reporting about earthquakes so you can go to the website and then check you know what are the earthquakes that they reported about but you don't have any other website that provides you some structured way of querying the data about things that happen so it's not it's going above the the level of the articles so it's not that we care so much about the individual news articles we care about the things which actually happen like things that happen in the world so GDELT has a different view of the events. So an, e an event in GDELT is basically anything that can be extracted from a sentence. So in that case, GDELT is the, in a way opposite of us because in that case you can have several events in one article. So you can have in one article mentioning that, I don't know, Obama met Putin, uh, they met in somewhere, and those, uh, th those can be several, th those can be different events. Although in our view of the event, that's a single event. Th that's an event where two people met, and they met on this particular date, they met at this location, those were the entities that were involved, so Obama, Putin, maybe the, some location and so on. So in that sense, we are qu quite different. And that's why I also defined what an event for us is, because it's, it's a very broadly used term. Um, I'm really interested about the um, uh, propagation study. How do you, um, maybe I missed... Compute, uh, yeah, I, I, we didn't mention at all how we compute because it's too much to describe the details. No, no not, the, not tracing the, the text reels, but determining that it is actually a propagation and not like a third source or just various sources. That's one of the, the actually the research questions that we currently examining so can we determine if uh, one source is only reusing the other source or there are both of these sources are actually using the, the third one um, this is some ongoing research work so for now we simply check if we have uh, one article here and another article here and we see that there are so many engrams that are matching then we say that this this the second one basically copied the first one um, we have been doing work on trying to see if we can find the third source. For now, we don't have a good model yet for, for determining that. We assume that if we crawl, if we have enough data, then we should also have the third source, which should be the original one. So in that case, we should also have that one. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, so now you have events up till three uh, years back. Um, are you planning on, like we had on lots of historical, uh, so you could go back further in time, basically? If we have enough data, we can, I mean, if the data is accessible, we can easily add additional data and then go much more back in the history. So one assumption is that to find, so it's easy to import the data and then provide the articles to be searched. So if we want to detect events, then we need at least some redundancy in the data. So we need at least a few publishers that report about the same thing. If we would only have one publisher, and there is only one publisher reporting about one event, 
then we would not find that to be an event because we need that kind of redundancy. We need multiple publishers talking about something and then once we have a big enough cluster, then we say, okay, this seems to be an event. Okay, yeah. Lots of the collections had like several English papers from the same age. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. So that's, that's fine, yeah. And would, but that would mean contacting you and getting you the data. There's no API basically to run my own data. Uh, there's no API. So we have a part of the a set of the services that I mentioned are available to be called as si simple web services. So you can easily call, let's say, the Wikifier and it will annotate you the data. So for the event registry itself, the system that's finding the, the clusters and so on, this is not something that's available through API to be basically just feeding the data and giving the events. So in that case, it would be us who would need to do this, yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. Very uh, impressive stuff you have there. But I have to have a comment, and I don't think uh, the event registry is the right name for this. I mean, even if I leave behind the discussions that have been going on among historians, what constitutes an event and whatnot, and French Revolution versus Basti, it's a, it's a news registry, let's say, and like, there's lots of research that's been done in media studies on actually how certain events do not get reported, right? Like this is a very selective process, so uh, like on this sort of epistemological level, I have to deeply, deeply disagree with how uh, your work presents itself. Uh, on a lighter note, however, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, in terms of the categorization, uh, the, the news topics like sport, the, the categories like that, do you extract them through machine learning or is it, do you just sort of try to identify uh, like topic modeling or something? Or do you try to just identify them as the news identifies uh, the uh, article? We classify using machine learning, yes. So we have models for all, each of those categories and then we classify into that uh, taxonomy. And regarding the, the name, I agree. I ag agree that we are for sure missing many important events which are not covered in the news. But I mean, we are covering what's covered in the news. So we cannot identify things which are not mentioned anywhere. So we are not wizards. Uh, <laughs> but I agree that things are missing, yeah, sure. Yours? Yeah, just a very uh, small question um, connected to the, um, not the last question, but the one before that. And, and, and that is, um, do you have a buffer? I mean, is this a cumulative uh, project in the sense that you keep the, all the information you've collected and then build up on it so that over in 25 years' time you would have a huge database? It's cumulative, yeah. It's so cumulative. we don't don't delete things. So this basically started. We started like three years ago, adding the content, and it's still all the content in the in the system. So we don't know what will happen once the the content grows too much. Yeah, so that would we, be we'll my try next to question. remove at least the the data which is not relevant. So we do crawl. You know, three hundred thousand news is a lot. So it's not that all the all that news is relevant. So we are pretty sure that a lot of the news that we do crawl can be potentially removed without any kind of loss of information. So in that sense, we will try to remove the, the some data, at least the older data, but we'll try to keep at least the, the events themselves. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about multilingual text processing, because you cover many languages. So I would like to know if you have created, developed tools from scratch, or if you have reused available NLP tools we, we developed our own, so I've mentioned this CCA. So CCA is not our technique, so CCA is a well-known technique, uh, but we do have our own implementation and also our, our own improvements. So there is a paper, uh -huh, sorry. Can you, uh, so here is a... Explain what the abbreviation stands for? A canonical correlation analysis, so sorry. Uh -huh, I think I... There is a... Ah, oh, no, here it is. There was some link, I forgot now on which slide, but there is a link to the paper where we basically describe the, the methodology. But basically it's, uh, you try to map the article from the original language to the, some semantic space, and you train this mapping from the original to the semantic space using a line corpus. So you Sorry, but so for example, name, name identity recognition, there are many tools already available, for example, also for Italian, that's my language. Why didn't you use already available tools? 
So it's not, so the CCA is not using the semantic annotations. So it's not using the annotations that you can first identify in the news or in the article and then see if uh, this set of semantic annotations is similar to another set of semantic annotations. Because in that case, you depend on the semantic annotations. So in our case, we just depend on the words. And the words in this mapping is somehow it's trained, uh, it's trained using the aligned corpus. It's another approach. Another approach would be that we would simply use the, the semantic annotations and then compare them and then based on this compute similarity, but it's not this approach. So we use something else. I'll shout. Um, what would it take to add another language? Uh, actually, we are constantly adding additional languages. It's not taking much. So as I said, these semantic annotations that we have are already uh, supporting 100 languages. So it's, for us, it's pretty cheap and inexpensive to add additional languages. Typically, it's mostly in the user interface that you then need to maybe add some features. And then when it grows too much, you need a different way of showing. You know, When you have an event with 20 languages, then you need another way of showing this. So we, it takes very little. I didn't think about the questions, but uh, uh, I would like to ask you, because um, we had some conversation before this meeting, uh, whether you could tell us something about the collaboration with researchers that you had that used it for scholarly purposes. So you, you mentioned the example of uh, the disaster detection that a social scientist could use, but maybe you could also say a few things on the interaction that you had with, uh, with researchers. So uh, this product was actually developed for not for the purpose of researchers who would be, let's say, analyzing disasters. It was developed uh, for the news publishers to basically detect relevant things for them as soon as they happen, to see what other people or other news publishers are reporting about the same event that they need to report about and so on. So it was developed for a different goal. Uh, since then, we have been basically uh, each day I'm getting emails uh, from people who are researchers who are trying to use the system for their purposes. So for example, even yesterday, I got an email from a person who is a medical doctor and he wants to get all the articles about HIV in US. So, you know, simply, they simply, uh, I think different people have different goals. So I think it's not so easy to say that they have some common or some uh, very shared goals. Uh, but I think that the, the features that are provided are broad enough that they can be, uh, you know, met. So in that sense, I would say that I think it's there is no simple answer. Yeah. So it's 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 an open question, and, and if, yeah, if you have yeah. one type of user, then there's only one story. But if you have many many different uh, types of researchers coming to you, then then of course the story becomes. Uh, more complicated. For now, I haven't now. seen yet uh, some very generic pattern that I would say that, you know, typically researchers come with the problem of, you know, finding events about this particular topic or using this criteria because they have different different yeah. kinds of... And based on the, the feedback that you get from this, this type of uh, researchers, do you have an insight in uh, what uh, other platforms that gives access that give access to newspapers um, uh, uh, have as strong points that you are not able to offer or the other way around do you have that overview or is that not something that you have been able to uh, don't generate right now so I have uh, experience with let's say so one similar as it was mentioned, this GDELT is another project which is in a way similar to this one. It's also trying to identify events. Uh, I haven't been able to use GDELT in some simple form. So I'm not sure how other people use GDELT, but I wasn't able to use it in, in some... And it is an interface aspect. Yes, so one is the interface, but also the data that they provide. I haven't been able to understand the, the actual uh, what they provide. So another way is uh, European Media Monitor. So European Media Monitor is another product which is available. It's developed by European Commission, not developed, but by funded by European Commission. 
And they also uh, identify events, similarly like us, in different languages and so on. But it's all only focused on the uh, crisis. So it's basically bombing attacks, uh, uh, natural disasters and so on. So it's not generic news. It's only focused on the, basically the incidents. That's so it's the data it, aspect. Yeah. That's the data. And I'm also not sure how open it is for, let's say, for the research purposes. Uh, because I think it's uh, funded by European Commission for some other purposes. So, so I don't have experience with other systems. But okay. um, as you mentioned, uh, just behind you, and then you will scan. And, and just to tell you, and also to slightly apologize to Menzel, I somehow missed that she had more than half an hour so I'm taking your time now, you see, so maybe you can come show some visualizations. <laughs> you're, you're stating that you have various, various types of users and that what is relevant for the one is not relevant for the other. But sometime beforehand you said that you, in, in, in the future, will, be, will delete what is not relevant. Yeah. But what, what, is not re what seems to be not relevant today can be very relevant tomorrow, depends on what's happening. That's true, but still... Uh, we still, let's say, see even now that we crawl some news sites that, let's say, provide automatically, automatically generated news about uh, stock prices. So, okay, stock prices maybe are relevant for some people, but, you know, automatically generating content is probably not some high value. So you can, if you want the value of the stock price, you can go and, and get, get that directly. So we don't need to have news about that. Similarly, it doesn't make sense that we have weather reports. Although maybe for some purposes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we'll keep the weather reports. <laughs> you see, so it, it is kind of, uh, it is tricky, but uh, still, if, if we want to have high quality data about, let's say, relevant world events, then probably some news data is less relevant than some other news data. So that, that would be the same. But I agree that we can delete too much if we are not careful. Daria? Um, I have a question about uh, events and how you understand them. Uh, would, um, would a report about the same world event from um, very different parts of the world, like the United States and Russia on a problem in Syria, would this be generated as a single event where you could compare how differently they, they perceive what's going on, because sometimes they say well, one side is protecting, the other one is attacking, and they're using completely different vocabulary for yeah. describing what's happening. It would be detected as the same event, and that's exactly one of the things that we have been al already trying to do with this news bias experiment, because you, because you do have you know, um, articles about the same event in different languages, so you have different viewpoints, you could say, you can easily analyze over several events, you know, how the different media is using different kind of vocabulary to express the, the same, the same w things. So that was exactly one of the, the results also that we saw, for example, when US is talking about maybe some, some Syria, uh, Syria attack, they use like terrorists and so on, whereas if you look at the local media, they use words like, you know, protecting and, uh, and, and troops and so on. So it's very you can easily detect these differences yeah, in the viewpoints. Um, okay. if, um, so if I'm, if I'm a, an external data set and I, I use your data set through the API and I want to link to you, um, do you publish as linked open data? Do you have resolvable URIs so do you for your data? The URIs for the events are resolvable, yes. So we also <laughs> export the data in the RDF form. So we have a person who is trying to do that. I think he's a bit of a, uh, he's sleeping a little bit on that for now, but uh, it's definitely one of the goals yeah, that we have this as an linked open data uh, information. Thank you. Uh, you know, you, you're getting a lot of question, but question but th this seems like a tool which is at a very advanced state so I mean w whatever the drawbacks and the critique uh, which is um, uh, interesting as well it seems to do a lot of things but I, also, uh, um, I have a question about the user group um, in, in, to what extent is your user group commercial 
I, I was looking at the um, manually named uh, entities <laughs> on your website, which include um, Bank of America, IBM, Johnson & Johnson, JP Morgan & Chase, and so on and so on. Um, so so uh, what's the commercial interest for this, uh, this tool? Yeah, so we have, uh, so these are the, the basically the, the people who are using, so we, we do monitor who is using our service, we do analyze that, uh, if somebody was asking before, so we do monitor who's using us, and so these are some of the, the, the companies that we know that are using us. Um, so for non-commercial purposes, we are open completely. So if we see that we constantly get requests from some commercial uh, company, then we do try to somehow suggest if they can somehow provide some fees for that. Because at the end, we still need to provide the machinery behind that. And the machinery for this is, for example, quite not so expensive, but it's quite uh, high in demand. So we, for example, for this data, we have 800 gigabytes of data and we need to have uh, quite strong machines to basically support the data requests. We don't enforce this, but it is something that's somehow suggested. At least in a way of providing the life, which is again in the, uh, as, a, uh, as an answer to the question that you had for the two talks previous, it's a way of how can you provide that this will be alive in, you know, in a year or two. And this, that's one of the ways how we try to be that. Not many. <laughs> so for now we are mo mostly uh, just funded by the research projects. So we currently have a few research projects that we can then uh, use this on to continue the work. Um, yeah. yeah, my question is about the credibility of information. Do you have any problems with that or do you weigh the information that comes from different sources, whether they are misinform misinforming or disinforming? So we are not trying to be the, the ones who decide on this. Um, we do provide simply, you know, content as we get it. So I think in a way it's also providing you a way to decide on your side, you know, in a way, because if you open an event and then you see 10 articles that state one fact, and then you have another article which states completely the opposite, it's up to you to decide, you know, whether you want to trust or not. So in that sense, it's also giving you the tools to, to decide. 